So this is the prism spectrometer. Specifically, it's this part here that is the spectrometer. Back here, we have a light source. So if you turn that on, right now we've got a helium spectral tube in there. So the only safety concern with this experiment is that these light sources do put out a very high voltage, so just keep your fingers away from the light sockets. Your prism should already be set up on top of the spectrometer. If it's not, ask your lab instructor for help setting that up. And as I said, this piece here is your actual spectrometer. It tends to slide around on the desk a little bit too easily, so you may want to just hold things while you're working with it. But all you need to do with this is swing the telescope back and forth and take measurements. So you don't need to make any adjustments here, you just need to move your telescope. Now one thing you should do is, with the telescope lined up with the collimator, which is the tube back here, you want to look through the telescope and make sure that the central image looks nice and bright. So the central image just looks like a bright stripe of light, the same color as this tube. So you look through and you look at the central image and you want to make sure that it's as bright as possible. If it isn't, what you do is just gently move this back and forth a little bit until that image looks nice and bright and in focus. And by the way, there's also a set of crosshairs that you'll see through the telescope and you should be able to see those as well. So if something looks a little blurry, it usually just means get your collimator a little closer to the light source and just move back and forth until everything's nice and bright. So now let's talk about this helium lamp. It's putting out a bunch of different wavelengths, but it's not putting out all wavelengths. It's not white light. It just puts out a few specific wavelengths. And that's actually due to quantum mechanics. So what's useful about using this lamp is that if we put that light through a prism, then it refracts over here, but all the different wavelengths, they get refracted to slightly different angles, which means we actually see the colors spread out and we can look at them individually. Now what's interesting about this is that you can put your face here and look at the prism and move your head back and forth and you can see those spectral lines with your naked eye. And so that's what I recommend you do, is you get your face down here, look toward the prism, look back and forth, and when you see the colored lines, then you can grab this, move the telescope over, and look at those lines through the telescope, which will give you the precision you need to take good measurements. Now, by the way, when you get the telescope over here, if the spectral lines don't look very bright, you're welcome to just grab this guy and again, wiggle it back and forth a little bit in order to get the brightest possible lines you can. So you can do that at any point in the experiment. Now we are going to need to take measurements off of these spectral lines. And as I mentioned, when you look through the telescope, you'll see a set of crosshairs. And those are for putting on the spectral lines and then taking measurements. You take the measurements here off a little scale, and I'll explain more later about how you do that. But for the actual experiment, it's not as simple as just putting the crosshairs on it and taking a reading, because we need to find something called the angle of minimum deviation. So let me explain what that is. So let's imagine the light hitting the prism at some angle. It refracts when it goes into the glass and it refracts again when it leaves the glass. And so the beam deviates from the path it would have taken if it had never hit the prism. But that path is not unique. So if you twist the prism, then the amount of deviation changes. And specifically when you're in this configuration, where the beam of light is entering the glass at the same angle that it's exiting it, you get the angle of minimum deviation. In other words, if you twist the glass even more, the deviation gets bigger again. So there's only one angle that you can tilt the glass to, which will give you the angle of minimum deviation. And this is the angle that you'll be taking your data at. So say you want to take data on one specific line, say the red line. So you move the telescope over here so you can see the red line. You don't need to put the crosshairs on it yet because you need to make one further adjustment before you take data. And then what you're going to do is you're going to come in here and you're going to twist the prism just slightly back and forth. So basically grab it here, and just twist it a little bit back and forth. And not surprisingly, when you're twisting it here, you'll see that red line move back and forth across your field of view. So what you want to do is you want to make that line move back towards the central image. That is, you want it to move this way across your field of view. So you'd come in here and you'd twist this. So let's say you're twisting your prism in this direction. What's interesting is that you'll see that red line move towards the central image, but at a certain point it'll stop, it'll turn around, and it'll start heading away again, even though you're twisting the prism in the same direction. So the red line can only go so far over this way, and then it switches direction and starts heading away again. When it's as close to the central image as possible, when it's as far this way as it can go, that's your angle of minimum deviation, and that's what you want to measure. So you twist the prism back and forth until you've moved the red line as far this way as you can, 
right at that point where it wants to change direction. And then you stop adjusting your prism, and now you take data. So then you would go in and move the telescope so that the crosshairs are right on top of that red line, and you take a reading here. And that's your first measurement. It's also only half of the information that you need, because what you actually want is the difference between here and the central image. This angle here between the two is what we're looking for. That's our angle of minimum deviation. So you've got one measurement here for this position. You still need to measure the position of the central image. So that's what I'll do now, is I would move this back to the straight ahead position, find that central image, put the crosshairs right on it with my telescope, and take a reading here. And then this position minus this position gives us the angle of minimum deviation that we're looking for for the red line. Then you want to go back and do that for all the rest of the spectral lines. Your central image position won't change, so you only need to measure that once, but you would go back and you'd find your next spectral line, so the yellow line, for example. And again, you make sure you can see it in the telescope view, and then you'd come in here and you'd twist the prism back and forth a little bit, such that the line tends to move back towards the central image, so back this way. So you twist the prism, you watch that line, and when you find the point where it wants to change direction, when it's gone as far that way as it can go, that's where you stop adjusting the prism, and then you put the crosshairs directly on top of the yellow line, and you take a reading. And like I said, this reading, minus the position of the central image, gives you your angle of minimum deviation for the yellow line. And it may not be obvious when you're doing this for all the lines that there is a different angle of minimum deviation for each of them, but there is. So you want to do it every time very carefully, and you find the angle of minimum deviation for all of them. So the last thing I'll tell you about is how you read the vernier scale in order to take your data. So previously in the video, every time I pointed at the front of the spectrometer and said, take a reading here, this is what here looks like. So I'm going to show you how to read this scale. There is an appendix in the lab manual on how to read vernier scales and micrometers. You should read this also, but I'll go over the basics right now. So there's two scales here. There's a scale along the top and this scale along the bottom. The scale along the top is attached to the telescope, so when you move the telescope, this top scale will move also. So we're going to take our readings off of the top scale, but what do we use as our pointer to take the reading from? Well, we use the zero line on this bottom scale. So wherever the zero points, that's our reading of whole degrees of angle. So right now you can see that the zero line is pointed at 96 point something on the top scale. So what are the rest of the numbers on that bottom scale for? Well, they're there to help you estimate the point something. So we get the whole degrees off of the top scale, but we figure out how many tenths of a degree off the bottom scale. The bottom scale, unfortunately, is not in units of tenths of a degree. It's in units of seconds of arc. But as I'll show you, it's actually really easy to convert seconds of arc into degrees. So what you're looking for on this bottom scale is one line that lines up exactly with something that's above it on the top scale. So for example, this first line doesn't quite line up with anything above it. The next one doesn't quite either. The next one is getting a little closer, and then this line here looks like it lines up exactly with the 100 line on the scale above it. The line after that also doesn't look like it quite lines up. It's a little bit short of the line above. So there's only one line from 0 to 60 that looks like it lined up exactly with one of the lines on the top scale. So each of these little tick marks is 5 seconds of arc. So 5, 10, 15, 20. So the 20th second of arc line lines up exactly with a line above it on the top scale. That means the point something on our reading is 20 out of 60 seconds of arc. So to put it all together, using the zero line, we can see that our reading is 96 point something, and the point something comes from looking at the vernier scale and realizing that the line at 20 seconds of arc is the one that lines up exactly with one of the lines on the scale above. Therefore, our reading is 96 degrees plus 20 out of 60 seconds of arc, and you can work that out on your calculator to be 96.333 degrees. And that's our angle reading for the telescope's current position. And as I mentioned, the lab manual has an appendix on how to read vernier scales and micrometers. You should read that also.